Okay, so do you do this? Or, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, um, so thank you for joining. We're with the you're here for the Center for Data Science PhD admissions information session. Um, this is just some of the items that we will be talking about today. Um, we'll go through a welcome and overview of the program and our curriculum. Um, there'll also be an overview of the medical school track within the PhD in data science. Um, a quick overview of the admissions and application requirements. And then we also have some faculty and students here to give lightning talks on some of the research that's happening here at the center. Um, so first up will be Professor Christina Savin, who's the Director of Graduate Studies for the PhD program, and she'll give you a welcome and overview of our PhD program. Uh, hello, all. Uh, welcome to uh, to this open session. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll be able to address your questions and uh, get you excited about the program and potentially joining us. Um, so data science is a new field. It's sort of, it's been spurred by um, some technological developments, like the fact that we now have extremely large data sets and um, that we have new machine learning tools to make sense of them, to fit models to them and use them in practice. Um, but um, this new emerging field has kind of two dimensions that are relevant. There's the methodological development, um, like new make, making new machine learning algorithms, making theories about them, um, sorting all sorts of um, like concrete engineering problems that have to do with dealing with extremely large data sets on one side and the applications domain uh, domain that we, we don't just make tools in the abstract, we, we want to use these tools in order to make impact in the real world across a wide range of disciplines um, that are all um, to some extent represented um, as part of our CDS faculty. So interesting science happens at the intersection between these two. And there, there are many different ways in which you can make an impact in this field somewhere in this space. Um, so, but the program as a whole, thanks. <laughs> um, th th this is a relatively recent pro program, but one of the earliest um, PhD um, graduate programs, specifically in data science, as opposed to CS or machine learning or statistics more generally. Um, it is funded by a training grant by uh, like from the NSF uh, with the goal or sort of like, building the next generation of data scientists. Um, and as we said, as the field as a, as a whole, the program itself spans multiple subdisciplines like machine learning, um, the use of machine learning in science and applications, theory of machine learning, um, data engineering and visualization, responsible data science, and the medical track that, that you're going to hear a little bit more about. Um, later um, in the presentation. Um, what the curriculum looks like, it's a combination of um, like class training and a lot of research. Um, there's a total 72 credits that you need to get um, from coursework that covers a bunch of um, core classes that are required for the program um, and several electives together with research rotations in one or several um, research labs as, that, that are part of the CDS faculty. Um, and again, there's a broad range of data science topics that, that are potentially covered in, in this space. Um, we keep track of the performance of our students through several means. There's a yearly review um, where we're sort of like checking in to see how you're doing, um, like um, providing advice about how to improve or sort of like long-term achieve career goals. Um, there are also some, uh, a, part, a couple of uh, exams as the comprehensive exam that tests this general scientific knowledge of interest and the depth qualifying exam that focuses specifically on the research program that you're trying to build as part of your thesis work. Uh, we also encourage our students to teach uh, because that's useful um, both for our, for our uh, really covering our own teaching needs, but more importantly, for people to develop skills in explaining science to a broad audience and sort of being able to communicate effectively in this space. 
Um, and then um, at the end, of course, you, you, you have to write your dissertation and defend it. Um, Yes, that's that, that that's it for for the basics. I'm gonna take uh, like let Dan um tell you a little bit about the medical program and any questions you might have. I'm gonna be here until the end of the session, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Should we stop share and then Dan, feel free to share Great. your screen. I will yep. share right now. Um. Okay. Are you seeing my title slide there? Yes. Excellent. Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dan Sodickson. Uh, I, I serve as Chief of Innovation in the Department of Radiology here at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and also as co-director of an institute called Tech for Health. Both of these enterprises I mentioned because they are in need of good data scientists all the time. Uh, and so basically because more and more areas in medicine and technology have been looking to modern artificial intelligence for key new advances, I've been part of ongoing initiatives to foster robust connections between the Center for Data Science and the School of Medicine. And I'm here right now to say a few words about why you should consider pursuing the uh, NYU CDS uh, PhD medical track. And I said a few words. I have six words for you in particular. First of all, problems. Uh, you should consider this track because we have lots of problems. Um, but what I mean, of course, here are the good kinds of problems, or at least good for you. I'm talking about unsolved problems and unmet needs in biomedicine, how to preserve brain function with aging, how to predict and prevent cancer or arthritis or heart disease, uh, how you might detect subtle changes in an individual state of health. It's well known that a problem-rich environment fosters innovation. Uh, and so, for example, people have said that, that Bell Labs, which brought us the transistor and the laser and the telephone system and all kinds of other innovations, they didn't just have the best solutions, they had the best problems. And, and the scientists there were immersed in a problem-rich environment and allowed to kind of follow their noses in it. And so I think that's the kind of environment um, we have here at this interface between medicine and, and um, data science. My second word is people. Um, there are a whole lot of smart and motivated people here waiting to work with you. Um, and in fact, there's a real hunger for data science work here at the School of Medicine, I can tell you, and, and also a rich ecosystem of departments and centers working on it. So you'll have mentors, colleagues, people with diverse training and perspectives all around you as you're doing your training. Third, you'll benefit from a range of powerful partnerships. Uh, there's, of course, the foundational partnership between uh, Center for Data Science and the School of Medicine, um, but the Tandon School of Engineering is also very much in the mix. And uh, here in New York, we have some other great partnership opportunities. So, you know, I myself a few years ago found myself accidentally working closely with Facebook, now Meta, on a project to speed up MRI. And of course, CDS has strong connections with, with Meta from the beginning. And there's also a very rich ecosystem here of, of startups, of, of larger companies. Everybody sort of wants a footprint in the New York area. Oops. Okay, and then fourth, you're training to be data scientists. So for that, you need data, right? And we've got lots of data here at the School of Medicine. Uh, so in our Department of Radiology alone, we perform more than 2 million imaging exams per year, uh, many of which encompass thousands of individual images. So it's a huge volume just in the imaging space. And then there's our medical health record and our pathology slides and our population health studies and our hospital operations, and the list goes on. And then I mentioned data, but for data science, of course, you also need science. So here, whoops, I'm referring to key domain expertise, which you know you really need in machine learning. Otherwise, it, it's operating blind. So you'll find experts here at the School of Medicine in genetics and imaging and ophthalmology and oncology and really everything else under the sun. And then finally, and arguably most important of all, there's impact. So 
you know, you have a choice of how you apply your data science acumen. Uh, I would argue that biomedical science, obviously I'm biased, I'm in it, um, is an area of great need and also of great import for the day-to-day -day welfare of humanity. Um, so uh, I remember, you know, in, in giving this introduction a few years ago, I was talking about the potential to make a difference for the COVID crisis, for example. Um, and that potential became real very quickly. Um, I can cite another illustrative example right here in my own department of radiology. Um, we are now really hard at work trying to develop the medical imaging scanners of the future and transforming the future of preventative medicine using imaging. And there are all kinds of, not surprisingly, new developments in machine learning, which can help in this kind of early detection uh, arena. And I just am showing the, the picture up top here of um, a student of mine, a CDS medical track student of mine, Arda, who's working on this problem with me and with us here. So basically, those are the words I had for you, but don't just take my word for it. Um, you're going to be hearing some lightning talks next, I guess, from faculty and students who are going to give you complimentary glimpses of what the program's like. So welcome once again to the open house, and uh, I hope uh, you find yourself interested. Thank you, Dan. Um, I don't think there are specific medical track questions in the Q&A, but just to cook, Francesca, do you see anything that may be relevant? There was one question about if they're part of the medical track, would they get a different kind of degree? And I think the, the simple answer is no. Um, so tracks are, are just sort of like topics of interest. So it, it a little bit organizes the research directions and the choices of electives and things like that, but it's not really um, administratively something different. But what you do get to do is you have your classes with all of the, you know, all of the other students, but then you can come and work in labs, for example, at the School of Medicine, depending upon the department you're in. So um, you sort of get uh, the same program, but but options that are appropriate to the track. Great. Thank you. Um, so let me yeah. just share my screen. Um, so my name is Catherine Angelis. I'm the Director of Academic and Student Affairs at CDS, so one of the staff members here that helps run in the academic programs um, at the center. Um, so just in the next few slides, I just want to quickly go over some admission requirements, application requirements, and some important information to keep in mind. Um, there are there will be detailed there's detailed information on our website and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences website, so that should always be your first place of contact, first place source of information. But if you have also, if you have further questions, you can always email us at cds-admissions at nyu.edu. Um, so very generally, a couple of our admissions requirements for the program. Um, we welcome applications for candidates with relevant backgrounds, um, but that's pretty broad of, of an explanation. But just for example, we some of the applications we've received are from undergraduate graduate degrees in math, statistics, computer science, engineering, other scientific disciplines that develop skills in making predictions using data, data science related. Um, but we are looking for a variety of backgrounds in our applications. Um, and then some of the coursework that we look for as prereqs are those in calculus, probability statistics, and programming. Um, as for the application requirements, we do require the TOEFL or the IELTS, which are English proficiency exams for those applicants who are not native English speakers or who do not have a bachelor's or master's degrees from an institution where the language of instruction is English. If you have questions about whether this is required for you, feel free to email us um, or the graduate school also has a website um, detailing what's who, who should be submitting this requirement. Um, we require college transcripts, three letters of recommendations, and we prefer them to be on letterhead. If that's not possible, then that's okay. It's just a preference, a statement of academic purpose, and then the GRE is not required for the PhD. Um, and then that link on this will take you to the admissions requirements for our PhD program. Some important dates, the fall 2024 online application is open and that's a link to the resource center which will take you to the online application. The application deadline is Tuesday, December 5th at 5 p.m. We don't accept late applications and we don't have a priority deadline. All the reviews happen after December 5th, 
but we do expect all materials to be in by the December 5th deadline. So your application should be complete. Um, we also only admit for the fall cycle, so we don't have spring admissions for the PhD. Um, so now we will turn to lightning talks. Um, so we have some students, some alumni and faculty who are here to speak about their research. Um, as we go through the talks, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and then we'll try to read them out loud after each of the talks for any that are relevant um, about their research. But Aram is first. Aram, are you, do you have slides that you want to share? Yes, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Do is this are people going to ask me questions or this is just an expose and then they can add, email me questions afterwards? Um, so if there are any relevant questions in the Q&A module, we'll try to read them out loud. Um, but if you're open to people emailing you, you can also share. I have attached my email at the end so people okay. can. Sounds good. Me. Okay, cool. thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, how do I do this? Okay, cool. I get 10 minutes, right? Yes. Cool. Okay, so um, hi everybody. There's a lot of people here, so hopefully everyone takes away a little bit of something. Uh, my name is Aram, and I'm a fourth year PhD student. Uh, I work on optimal transport, so I do theory, statistics, and applications. I quickly skimmed some of the Q&A, and hopefully I'll be able to answer some of those questions over the course of this presentation. So I wanna say that I have a lot of great uh, mentors and just overall people that I've worked with over the last four years. So John is my PhD advisor, who I can't say enough good things about. Uh, I have collaborators internationally. So Vincent's a friend uh, in Paris. I'm currently part of the AI mentorship program. So I'm a part-time visiting researcher at Meta. I have done two intern, I've done one internship with them and I work with Ricky Chen and Brandon Amos. And I also collaborate with people at Apple. So there's a lot of, you'll have a lot of opportunity to do research here with a lot of fantastic uh, groups of people. Um, so about my research, so I do optimal transport. What's the main idea? We're given two sets of points in RD, and the task is to find the average cost of displacement. So we've got points in blue and points in red. And um, for each pair of points, there's an average, there's a notion of cost, right? It's going to take me some amount of energy to go from here to here. Um, if I have n points, then it takes n, then there are n factorial possible matchings. And this gets very expensive very fast. So you can't possibly search through all possible combinations, right? If I have eight points on either side, then there's over 40,000 possibilities and this is just awful, right? You can't possibly search this. So what do you do instead? Um, so this brings us to a Russian Soviet economist uh, in 1942 who discovered an N cubed procedure to find the best possible matching. And what's very cool about the story is that in finding this procedure, he was awarded, he birthed linear programming as a concept and was then awarded a Nobel Prize uh, 30 years later. So you'll have some matching that looks like this and you'll get it pretty quickly. Uh, so traditionally this doesn't, you know, people have used this for resource allocation, college admissions. So you can imagine uh, the blue are, you know, college students and the red are universities and we have to kind of match them in some way. Now, how does this relate to data science? Um, so in data science, we model everything as probability distributions, right? So you've probably heard that grades follow uh, normal distributions. This is a very infamous bell curve, um, you know, grade charts. Um, income can be modeled as a log normal, like some skewed distribution. Uh, these days, we say that images come from some space, right? So this is the space of marsupials on purple scooters, right, or something. Uh, text as well, right? And so we often want to compare how close two distributions are to one another. So P and Q are two distributions, how close are they? Right, so I want to know how close are marsupials on purple scooters to marsupials on red scooters or something. And so often we only have samples from these two blobs P and Q, right? But if I only have samples, then I actually know how to compare them, right? This is what Kantorovich showed. Um, when you only have samples, I can actually figure out how to pair up things pretty, pretty fast. And as n goes to infinity, so, right, so the number of black circles fills up the whole distribution, we obtain what's called a Wasserstein distance. And so this is basically a very um, powerful tool to compare two probability distributions and it defines a metric and all these other nice properties. And so in the special case of this notion of cost, we in fact have what's called an optimal transport map that sends particles on the left to particles on the right. 
And so with this, we can basically say, well, if I have a new data point from P, I can basically figure out where it is in Q. So this lets you basically generate new samples. Um, this is the, the crux of optimal transport in modern day data science. So the kinds of questions that I study typically fall under the following three um, general umbrella categories. Uh, so on the right, I've put in some of the papers that I've written and on the left are the categories. So I do some, I do theory, namely around entropic optimal transport, gradient flows, things like this. Uh, I work on statistics, theoretical statistics. So I want to know, I want to kind of quantify how many samples I need to do anything. And I work on machine, machine learning applications. So can I improve existing methods uh, with optimal transport or can I create new methods for optimal transport? Um, so on the theory side, so I can't go into this in too, too much detail, um, but a lot of works, basically, we, try, we want to try to figure out something about the map itself, this T0 that I talked about, but this is very hard to do. Uh, instead, entropic optimal transport is an approximation of optimal transport, so you get a soft matching um, in n squared time instead of n cubed time, and it's GPU friendly, so you can run this on over 100,000 samples and nothing's going to break, basically. And so what's nice is you, what we showed in this first, my first project is that there exists a very natural entropic map um, that approaches the optimal map as epsilon goes to zero. So epsilon is the amount of regularization that basically blurs out your matching. And so this has basically created a cascade of works in trying to better understand these theoretical properties of T epsilon. Um, this includes like proving uh, very old results uh, in mathematics, but also new ones that people haven't really discovered before. Because it's, this T epsilon is really used in practice often, so it's good to prove some theory results. Uh, in statistics, so like I said, um, I can create this estimator based on entropic optimal transport, but I want to know how many samples I need to say that I'm actually close to the optimal map, right? So theory is all well and good, but then theoretical statistics is even better. So we want to, I want to basically say that there's a function fn that depends explicitly on n that goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So this was in the same first project, but also uh, a few other, um, you know, works about how, what is the approximation ability of like shallow neural networks, things like this um, in approximating the optimal transport map. This is on the statistics side of things. Um, and now going to machine learning. So this is more stuff that I've done at Meta over the last, um, over the last year. So you've probably heard of diffusion models. Um, so what, what I worked on was a variant called flow matching. So diffusion models are these things that take, you know, Gaussian noise and output a data distribution like a checkerboard. And so this is the typical diffusion path for um, Gaussian to checkerboard. Flow matching does a slightly, is a slightly different variation of this where the paths appear more reasonable and the, the main idea is that we're going to do a very naive matching between points and you see the checkerboard appears faster um, than the traditional diffusion model approach. So what my project was about was seeing how we can use OT to improve this. And so using mini batch OT, we showed that at virtually no cost, the checkerboard can appear much, much faster. Uh, and this is useful. Why? Because ideally, if you have, like I said, if you have the optimal transport map, you can get everything in one shot, which I guess is not clear from the presentation, but this is the general idea. So you don't have to integrate the OD so much. Um, and I have some, I have two figures in this paper that basically are lower than the other baselines, which means my method is better. That's how, that's how research works. So, so this is one, one kind of project that I've done at Meta. And the other one is about um, what's called Lagrangian optimal transport. So before I talked about this notion of cost to match up two points, uh, instead maybe uh, I want to enforce a cost that forces you to move in circle directions, like on the left, or I want to avoid obstacles, also on the left. So with uh, Brendan Amos and Ricky and Carlos, we basically created this method, this framework for learning all these geometries from samples and also uh, outputting trajectories. This is very, very cool. Um, so this, this is the kind of stuff that I'm working on and I'm um, currently mentoring an undergrad, a master's student, and there's a lot of cool research to do here. Um, I see that there are a lot of questions, but if you have any targeted ones, please feel free to reach out. Um, my email is very easy to remember. That's my presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Aram. Um, there is, I think there is one specific one if you will have a minute. Sure. 
Yeah, uh, uh, can you use different distributions apart from Gaussian distribution? Yeah, nothing about this has anything to do with Gaussians. Yeah, this is for modeling general distributions. Yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you so much for your time. For sure. Yeah. Um. So and I think so now Lavender is next. Lavender, do you want to share your screen? Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. You can start whenever you're ready. Uh, this is Lavender. I'm a third year PhD and I'm a medical track student. So that means I am co advised by a faculty at the medical school. So Eric Orman, who is a neurosurgeon. Uh, and also like a physician scientist, and then Kyung Hong Cho, who's from the Center of Data Science, uh, and she specializes in like more in NLP, so working with text data. Uh, and I did this project for the first uh, two years of my PhD. It's a uh, collaboration between NVIDIA, uh, the CDS, and the Langone House. Um, and I have a lot of collaborators, like medical students, uh, there's like data engineers from Langone, and then there's also uh, wonderful physicians who uh, volunteer to help me verify my model. Um, so uh, this is a picture of Langone. It's at First Avenue and 30th Street near East River. Uh, so this is where I work, and it's a multi-borough health system with a very diverse uh, patient population. Um, and when I say diverse, uh, an evidence is this uh, pie Pi, pi graph of the demographic. Uh, you can see that uh, you know the pink uh, pink color is less, and then you have a larger blue color and also green color for Manhattan versus the rest of USA. Um, and I mainly work with the data I mainly get is from electronic health record or EHR. Uh, and in case you don't know what that is, here I am attaching an example of me, uh, so you know what it looks like. So if you are a patient at like house you will have this app called uh, I think my chart at epic so you can see my profile picture here uh you have my appointment information you know what medications I'm taking there's messages between me and the uh, physicians and nurses and there's also test results like blood tests or in this case uh, I did a uh, x-ray at my chat uh and you can see not only the images but also what the radiologist wrote about uh, what they found in my chest. So, um, so I have access to this uh, EHR data um, and they document, as you can see, they document a lot of clinically relevant information. Um, so for my research, I use 10 years of the EHR uh, notes, so text notes to portray a uh, language model from scratch. Uh, and then subsequently we fine tune them to perform a specific classification tasks. Um, so just to give you another example of a, what a clinical notes look like, uh, it is an enriched feature of each patient and case in a unified format. So for example, this is the note of me when I went to the emergency department uh, due to chest pain. Uh, so you, are, you can already see uh, that uh, it, uh, it talks about my medical history. Uh, you can see my blood pressure, my heart rate, my temperature, and you can also see the result of my physical exam. Um, so this is just an example to show that um, all the information like lab measurements, treatment, are ultimately integrated into the notes written by physicians. Uh, apart from these benefits, the notes also contain physicians' assessment beyond direct measurement and treatments. So for example, uh, you can, the, sometimes the physician will say that uh, the patient is a homely person, so then uh, you know that they they are probably really poor, and it's possible that no one would take care of them after you discharge them. Uh, or sometimes the physicians will uh, talk about how the, phys, uh, how the patient went, uh, uh, underwent, uh, for example, domestic abuse. So you can take those social factors in account when you're trying to treat the patient. Um, 
So the problem that we were trying to tackle was the last mile problem. So if you're a data scientist or a computer scientist, when you saw all this wonderful data, I think a natural intuition is you wanna, you know, build some sort of predictive tools with it so that we can automate uh some uh we can automate and uh uh make the process more like the workflow more efficient for the medical professionals. Uh and in fact people have tried to do that in the past. Uh, so basically, uh, all those information are stored in the hospital's database as you can think of it as a giant Excel sheet. And then so people take those structured data from giant Excel sheet and then try to use traditional machine learning models like legacy regression or gradient boosted tree uh, to train classifier with it. Uh, and then the goal is that, you know, hopefully uh, we can use those uh, prediction to try to impact uh, or help the clinical and operational decision. Um, however, this type of model, although they're built, uh, although they're developed and published, they're actually not used commonly in practice. Um, and uh, there's a lot of reasons why, but I will like briefly discuss a few. Um, so one of the reasons is that uh, in those giant Excel sheets, a lot of the times the there's missing data. So so what if you have a patient with a lot of missing data, then your model is just not going to work very well. Uh, another problem is those models, uh, because you you are relying on this giant Excel sheet. So when you're trying to make inference, you need to wait for the database to update. But usually medical professionals, they need to make very time sensitive information. So they expect real time inference. So that's another problem. Uh, a third problem is uh, those lab measurements are usually in different units. So you need a standardization of different units. So that means that uh, like this discrepancy uh, usually means that if you train the model in Manhattan uh, and when you want to apply it to Brooklyn, you need to go over some really complicated like data engineering just to standardize the data. So that's why uh, we have a last mile problem, meaning that we have all those models, but they are not using practice. So they are not really helping the clinical and operational uh, decisions. Uh, and the our, our insights for this problem is that okay, maybe we don't need to use this giant Excel sheet since as we've seen that uh, a lot of them are actually integrated in the uh, EHR as clinical notes or text. We can directly go from text and then try to, you know, make prediction based on text. In that way, we don't have to, you know, feature engineer a few columns from this giant Excel table, but rather we will have a unifying format that goes from text to prediction. So we train our own model uh, from using 10 years of clinical notes and Langone, and then we fine tune them on five uh, tasks. So there are three clinical tasks and two operational tasks. Uh, so the first clinical task is in hospital mortality prediction. So basically we look at the patient's admission notes and then we try to predict how likely they will die in the hospital before we discharge them. So if we have an accurate prediction, then uh, you know we can prioritize higher risk patients and hopefully they won't die. Um, another clinical test is uh, we look at their uh, admission notes and then we try to predict how sick they are because the more sick they are, uh, the more probably the more complications they'll have. So um, the doctors need to be more careful. A third clinical test is 30 day all cause remission prediction. So basically we look at their uh, clinical notes and try to predict how likely would they come back within 30 days of discharge. So if they come back within 30 days, it's considered early uh, because if they come back prematurely, it probably means that maybe they're not, you know, they were not treated well or like an accident happened. Uh, so if we can make accurate predictions, there are interventions we can do to, you know, improve our quality of care. So for example, we can uh, extend their stay so we don't discharge them early, or we can have nurses that, you know, schedule follow-up calls with them to make sure they know uh, how to take medications and to make sure they have uh, enough social support. Uh, for operational tasks, uh, we were trying to help the hospital administrator. So the first task is uh, we look at the admission notes and then we try to predict how long the patients are staying in the hospital. Uh, and the reason why this is helpful is because uh, the meetings are running the hospital kind of like a hotel. So if you can know how long each patient is, is going to stay, you can manage the bad better. Um, another uh, operational task is we look at the patient's uh, 
clinical notes and try to predict how likely would their insurance claim get denied, it's meaning that how likely would they not get all their money back. So if we can make accurate predictions, then uh, the claim filing department can pay more attention to high risk patients and hopefully you know, more patients can get their money back. So due to the lack of time, I don't have a lot of uh, time to go over um, like the exact result that we have, but basically the gist is uh, our model performs better than those like giant Excel sheet based, like structure baseline model on all these five tasks. So, and apart from uh, the performance benefit, another benefit is now we are not, you know, doing all those painful feature engineering work, but rather we have a unifying framework that is fine tuning a pre-trained language model. We also did a really uh, like a uh, small scale comparison with six physicians. And we found that uh, although language model has a better performance than the medium physician is still worse than the most senior physician. Um, right, so now we have the unified approach to the last mile problem, which is we train a language model that reads clinical notes and then try to you know, predict, uh, predict clinical uh, events or like operational events that could hopefully eventually help the doctors and the administrators. Um, okay, so I'm go going to skip all the stuff due to time constraint, but if you're interested, you can check out our paper, how system scale language models are all purpose prediction engines. Thank you. Thank you, Lavender. Uh, maybe just one, we can take one question for you um, from the sure. chat. Uh, I think this is, did you use genome sequence of patients too to have some prediction model based on genome sequence or their gene expression? Is this type of project run in the labs? That's a good question. So I did not use that because uh, genomes are very, very long. So language models has a max sequence length problem. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a good idea to add that in the future so we can have multimodal model that eventually takes in not only text, but also genomes and maybe imaging as well. I'll interject because I want to add something. So there are several bioinformatics type of, of research projects going on in CDS at the moment that have to do with modeling sequences or, or like segments of, of uh, DNA, RNA, things like that. So there are projects uh, projects within that space going on. Um, and Kyung Kyung was also like um, uh, Lavender's advisor has been involved in some of that. Thank you. Thank you, Lavender. Um, so Artie, I think you're up next if you want to share your screen. Of course. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. okay, looks good, yep. All right, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Artie. Today I would like to share my research on explainable deep learning for medical image analysis. Uh, this is a short bio about me. I'm currently an assistant professor at NYU Radiology. And uh, in the coming semester, I'm, uh, I plan to hire several PhD candidates from CDS. If you're interested in working with me, please feel free to drop me an email. And this year, I just graduated from CDS with a PhD, where I was uh, co-supervised by Professor Christoph Giris and the Professor Kun Yun Cho. And prior to joining NYU, I uh, work at the Two Sigma Investments. So to illustrate my research, I would like to begin with an example. So imagine that you are a radiologist who is a doctor specialized at analyzing medical images and you have an assigned to analyze a mammogram, which is an X-ray image of the breast. And you have two AI assistants, each providing you with a diagnosis. So here, the first AI assistant you have is Alpha. So we, when presented with this image, Alpha responds with a 70% probability that this patient has breast cancer, but Alpha does not provide any explanations or evidence to, to support its diagnosis to make alpha a uh, strong candidate. Uh, suppose we know that alpha achieve a very, very high accuracy in a large scale retrospective study. Moreover, alpha is say FDA approved and CE marked. So you have another system that's called beta. So beta make the same conclusion as alpha, but beta highlights the area that it believes to be cancer. Moreover, beta can communicate when asked 
What's so special about those highlighted regions? It replied that it sees a distortion associated with a developing asymmetry. And according to BIRET, which is the standard reporting system of breast imaging, this kind of imaging patterns is associated with a high level suspicion for malignancy. So now the question is, become alpha and beta, which system would you trust? So I believe although alpha has very high accuracy, but many would still prefer beta because it provides a more interpretable diagnosis and we're able to understand and verify beta's rationale. But creating an AI system like beta is a very complicated process. And one of the major challenge is the lack of the training label that exactly match the desired task for the model. For example, to train a model like beta in a strongly supervision, we need to ask radiologists to first identify those regions of interest and then describe those regions of interest using technical language. And all of this process is very, very time consuming and it's very difficult to scale to a large data set. Additionally, there are situations in which even the expert do not know the answer. For example, during the emergence of the new disease like COVID-19, at that time, even the experts do not know what are the patterns associated with the disease on the medical images. And in these situations, it is not possible to use human-generated annotations to improve the interoperability of the model. So in practice, most of the labels that we use to train machine learning models are obtained from medical reports. However, those labels are often very noisy and only offer a very limited or coarse grain level of information. For example, in this pathology report on the right, we can indicate whether a patient has cancer or not, but it does not tell you about the location of the cancer, neither the specific attribute of the cancer. So there is a gap between what we want the model to do and what the label are we able to collect in practice. So my research aimed to address this gap. So the goal of my research is to create those interpretable deep learning models for medical image analysis that can learn from imperfect labels. Towards this goal, my research has mostly focused on weekly supervised learning, multiple instance learning, and contrasted learning. So in the following slides, I will briefly introduce several completed and ongoing research projects. So in the first project, we're trying to build a machine learning model that actually um, look at those mammogram images. And trying the goal here is trying to identify the exact location on the image by um, providing a segmentation map. However, in the training time, the difficulty is that we never observe those pixel level location information. Instead, we're only provided with binary labels, which tell us whether there's any cancer in the image. So technically, if you, know, if you know the location of the cancer, you know the binary label, yes or no. But if you only know whether there's a cancer in the image, you wouldn't know the exact location of the cancer. So um, for this task, we adopt a uh, weekly supervised learning paradigm, which is basically designed for machine learning models, specifically neural networks, to learn from those coarse grain labels and produce a more a fine grain outputs. In this case, the coarse grain label is the binary label and the fine grain output is the lesion segmentation. So this is one example where we can utilize weekly supervised learning to localize cancer without localization labels. And a similar approach has also been applied for COVID-19 prognosis. So in this task, we combine this weekly supervised approach with a greeting boosting tree, trying to predict the likelihood of future clinical deterioration among COVID-19 patients. So those predictions were then extended to form a deterioration risk curve, which was used to uh, assist the frontline uh, physicians in the triage of those COVID-19 patients. So the input includes an X-ray image at some clinical variable, including the vital sign, demographics, and lab test results. And the output includes a score determining whether this patient will have serious clinical deterioration within 24 to 96 hours, as well as an explanations. 
So unlike in breast cancer screening, for COVID at that time, no expert annotation were available because we do not know the typical patterns on chest X-ray that could link to future clinical deterioration caused by COVID-19. However, we do know which patient eventually experienced this clinical deterioration. So we decided to utilize this weekly supervised learning paradigm to, to uncover those informative patterns. So through the visualization of the saliency map provided by those um, weekly supervised model, we observed that for all those positive cases, the model assigned an increasingly higher score to abnormalities such as basal opacity, parenchymal consolidations, which is illustrated in this plot. And this study actually demonstrated that an interminable deep learning model can help us better understand an emerging disease. And in another study, what we did is we built an ultrasound, we built a model that parsed the ultrasound images and trying to predict the breast cancer from the ultrasound images. And what's so special about this study is that we actually did a simulation in which part of the cases were actually tri triaged to the AI instead of going to the like human radiologist. And in this simulation, of course, it's a retrospective one, we found out that the AI is able to handle nearly 76.5% of the cases and triage them into high risk and low risk, where the low risk patients auto are automatically dismissed and high risk patients will go through the biopsy procedural to determine the cancer outcome. And in the low risk work stream, we show that we're able to cap we are able to capture more actual we are able to provide a more sensitivity meaning that we are stronger at capture cancer as versus to radiologists and at high risk work stream we show that we are able to incur a much less cost as versus to radiologists so this is a, a typical study that we have done at um at uh, NYU CDS and Langone, where we build a model and validate it in the clinical practice to exactly show the actual clinical impact, just like instead of just like showing some like high performance like AUC. Uh, so uh, there are several ongoing projects at my lab. And one of the projects is we're trying to take the image and then generate the report. And not and in addition to report, we're also generating many patient-facing material, for example, follow-up instructions. So for uh, for example, for pancreatic cancer, many patients have developed pancreatic cyst, which requires a long-term follow-up. However, even if we issue the follow-up opinion to the patients, very likely sometimes they do not come back. They are, therefore, they might miss the optimal treatment time. So what we are doing in this project is we're trying to utilize those generative AI methods to generate, to generate a description and a follow-ups that can maximize the probability of this patient come, up, come back to us on time and then perform the next exams. In another project, we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to learn the location of cancer, but instead of directly learning from the explicit labels, we're, we're, we propose to utilize the, the radiology report which contains a natural language description about what is abnormal in the image, as well as what is where where is the exact lesion. So this is a very weak level signals, but we are trying to actually utilize them to perform a, a very difficult, a very precise task that is localized in the lesion. So in the last slides, uh, I would like to uh, share my experience about why NYU CDS is the best place for research like AI plus healthcare. So first of all, for those kind of research to succeed, we need the data both in large scale and high quality, as well as computation power. That, in, that needs to be, uh, that, that means like those cutting edge GPUs and it has to be always available. And lastly, we need to have an environment where we can very quickly validate our uh, model that is developed in the lab. So at NYU CDS, first of all, for the data, we have a PhD medical track in which the, one of the one of the supervisor comes from the medical school, and therefore has a much easier access to all those data sets from the hospital. And for the second point, we have three computation cluster with more than five hundred A one hundred and the V one hundred GPUs, which is almost matched industrial level computational power. And lastly, we have a very good 
um, relationship with the hospital, which have lots of experience in uh, implementing or like organizing prospect study to validate those models that are implemented um, in the retrospective setting. So uh, this concludes my talk. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please drop me my email. Thank you. Thank you, Artie. So maybe one question for you. Um, there's been a lot of this in the Q&A, but as an alum and also now someone looking for students in the medical track, do you, um, do, do, stu do students in the medical track require any prerequisites in medicine or have a background in medicine um, in order to be admitted or to work with you? And then also while you were a student, what types of electives did you take while you were in the medical track pursuing your program? Yeah, for the first questions, um, I can only answer from my perspective. Like, I do not require my student from P a CDS program uh, possess any medical knowledge. And to be honest, in the process of research, you will have lots of opportunities to learn those necessary medical knowledge to perform to build AI system for um, medical application. Uh, for the second questions, uh, when I was admitted, there was an the, 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 there hasn't been not uh, established this uh, medical track program. So what I did, the elective that I took is mostly from um, like the computer science and the math department. But there are lots of good courses that currently at CDS that offers data scientist students with a background of like medicine. For example, uh, this is called the deep learning for um, healthcare. That's a class that we have almost every year, as well as there is also a class from School of Medicine taught by a professor, uh, I think taught by, yeah, the professor from the School of Medicine, which tells you how the operation looks like, right? From when the patient is first go to the hospital, what procedure would be take to the patient to in order to kind of know what's the, what's, what's the appropriate diagnosis. And those are, those are, those, those course will offer you a very, like fundamental understanding about like all the necessary knowledge that you require for you to perform to build models uh, in, for AI models in healthcare. So you don't have to take any like a um, serious biology class, but they are already a very well-developed curriculum for you to understand it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So our last Lightning talk will be from a group of current PhD students. Um, Boyang, Akash, Kangning, will either any of you share your screen or? Oh, hi, Catherine. Uh, hi. Thanks for the uh, introduction. I will be sharing my screen later. And uh, the three of us will present our joint work uh, uh, and a little bit uh, uh, background introduction about myself. I'm currently a fourth year PhD student, fortunately to be co-advised by Carlos Fernandez Granda and Professor Rajesh. And a, my research focuses on understanding the uncertainties from machine learning models for healthcare data. Um, previously, I was uh, studying uh, math and statistics for my undergrad. So before entering this medical track, I wasn't really having like expert domain knowledge from the medicine side, but I feel like uh, through my learning and research experience, I uh, get more exposure to how the clinical system is working, how doctors make decisions and how doctors leverage those AI tools for make better decisions. And maybe I will uh, hand over to Kani and Akash so that they can also uh, briefly introduce themselves. Akash, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, hi everyone. My name is Akash and I'm currently in my last year of uh, PhD program. Um, at CDS, my research has also been primarily at the intersection of machine learning and healthcare. And I'm also advised by Professor Carlos Fernandez Granda and Professor Nargis Razavian from, um, from the medical school. And so my, my, my research has been mainly in helping the doctors do the like building models that can help them do prognosis and diagnosis, which can eventually help in patient re uh, recovery, uh, like improving patient outcomes. Um, so that's mainly my research. So yeah, I'm I'm also in my final year, uh, and I'm also in the same group as Akash and Boya. So currently, I'm working on uh, some problems for general computer vision and medical imaging study. 
So I've been mainly focusing on learning up without perfect supervision. Means that you want to tangle some real world problems. You presumably not have perfect labels. You don't even have labels sometimes. And how do you kind of solving these uh, problems? That's kind of my research uh, topic. Yeah, let's solve for now. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So we will be presenting our recent work on uh, how do we using uh, AI models uh, for a bunch of very different uh, diversified tasks, but with some similarities uh, within the data themselves. So um, um, can you guys see my screen uh, with uh, quantifying impairment using AI models trained on healthy subjects? Um, so this is like a very broad term. Uh, we have the AI models and we have like a very general healthy subject. So the overall idea is that since we have so many diversified uh, patient data for different diseases from different modalities, how are we going to leverage them to create like a more general way to detect those abnormalities as diseases? So for instance, um, uh, for many diseases, if they are rare, like heart cancer, you can barely find uh, enough patients to build an accurate model. But al alternatively, you always have like a bunch of healthy people out there so that you can uh, gather data from and then use the most uh, modernized tool to digest those data and extract information from them. And another characteristic about uh, healthcare data is that it is messy and uh, uh, in the sense that the labels can be imperfect and uh, there are missing information regarding each patient. So for instance, if you are encountering a data set, you will have uh, uh, maybe multiple scans uh, taken at different visits. How are you going to leverage this information to see the progression of a disease? And then inside each of the scan, there are different pixels or voxels representing different tissues. And how are the changes in the shape or the texture of this very fine grain tissue labels can affect the overall diagnostic of the patient. So uh, in practice, clinicians have uh, spent years learning either from school or from their clinical practice to build a model to tell what is the normal situation should be for a healthy control. And when they see something that is very different from the um, from this norm or from this um, reference distribution, they will, uh, they will be able to tell that there's something wrong with this patient. So we might make better decisions or apply a treatment or more sophisticated examination tools to uh, quantify and detect this abnormality. So this is um, basically the intuition that we want to leverage this healthy reference model to quantify disease. So we have a um, uh, very uh, diverse uh, application along this road. So the first thing we, uh, we tried is to uh, quantify the impairment of stroke patients using both wearable sensor data and video data. And then uh, we apply the similar framework to the knee osteoarthritis disease, which uh, involves MRI imaging. So a little bit, um, a very quick introduction to our stroke data set. So basically it has two sources and they are simultaneously captured to record the uh, uh, movements uh, of the patient and healthy subjects during their rehabilitation activities. And inside this data set, we have different levels of the labels. We have uh, patient level labels for their disease status and their severity scores. And later I will explain those scores. And for the um, uh, specific trials, we have asked the participants to do different activities. For example, ask them to drink water, brush their teeth and move objects from the table from uh, the end to the other end. And these are all uh, very common that could appear in their daily activities and as well as uh, capturing their movement patterns at uh, different uh, levels. And other than that, for each trail, we have a sequence of movements. And then we have a bunch of uh, volunteers and uh, uh, medical participants who label those uh, primitives we call to record uh, the 
the movement they are per, uh, performing during a short period of time. So for instance, among, uh, among those uh, motion primitives, we actually have uh, five categories, which, um, which are um, which are reach, transport, reposition. These three uh, primitives, they involve the motion movements that they actually doing something. But for the latter one, the stabilize and adult, they mostly record the status where the patient is taking a rest in the middle of uh, different movements. And then uh, what uh, the data we have right now is like we have a subject and we have multiple trials for this subject doing very different activities. And then for each single activity, we have different uh, temporal labels at different time frames. How are we going to leverage all this complicated information to develop something that is clinically meaningful? So let's go back and look at this uh, particular disease, stroke. Uh, what are the interests of uh, clinicians and what should we extract to help them understand the uh, diagnostic process or make better predictions? So I think we can skip most of the slides and jump to something called uh, uh, FM score. So this is an assessment to quantify the impairment of the stroke mobility difficulty. So in the clinical practice is that uh, the patient will go to the clinics and take this test to have a itemized score of each part of their upper body. And then the clinician will review their movement and have those uh, itemized scores. The final score will be the sum of each of the itemized score. And then this will be used as a proxy for their uh, uh, stroke impairment. And altogether, um, it will take about one hour to complete this test. And it requires that the patient to be present at the clinics. So uh, this is like a very uh, subjective, but uh, requires a lot of time. And also like a, you, you have to have a well-trained clinician to perform this test. So I think with the availability of this very detailed data set and a uh, machine learning tools or AI models to digest uh, both wearable sensor data and video data, we can have a better way to uh, automate this process. And considering that um, for stroke, actually uh, the impairment itself is embedded in the labels. Like for a patient with difficulty um, moving its hand, it will have irregular uh, patterns in the sequence it performs for drinking water. There will be unexpected shaking and unexpected pauses during the process. So with this uh, prior or hypothesis in our mind, we were trying to we were uh, first developing a sequence uh, action sequence segmentation model based on the input data, and then uh, and then once uh, this model healthy trained model is uh, well established, uh, we are trying to see uh, we're we're applying this. Uh, already trained model to a bunch of uh, out sample uh, held up participants to see uh, if the model is able to tell the difference between the healthy subject and the uh, subjects who are actually patients. So uh, how is that, uh, how, how does the model be able to tell the difference? So for instance, if you are doing some uh, classification task, uh, you have a label that is disease or healthy. The model is not just telling you just this uh, plain label. It outputs the, its confidence for each of the classes. And in our case, it's not necessarily the classes of uh, healthy or diseased. It's actually a bunch of fine grained classes for the movement at each time step. So uh, it's like for the functional movements prediction at each timestamp, the model is going to be able to uh, explain its understanding of the uh, sequence as a whole in, uh, and output a model confidence for that timestamp's prediction. And once we can be able to aggregate those overall confidence 
and we might we we will be able to tell that which part of the uh, sequence shows uh, uh, the flags a uh, severe uh, deviation that could be used to make the diagnosis that the patient is actually impaired. And since we have many, many fine grain data points in those movements, we will be able to use the aggregated confidence score to reflect the degree of impairment, which um, ultimately uh, uh, transform into a quantification of impairment itself. So uh, the idea is that for each patient, we will have uh, about 1,000 to 2,000 time uh, data points in terms of the timestamp for those tiny functional movements. And for each of the uh, data points itself, it might not be like uh, be able to tell whether the patient uh, is uh, diseased or healthy. But once you aggregate them, the distribution, it contains much more information. So for instance, this is a very simple illustration. It's like uh, the red, uh, the red part represents the histogram of the confidences for an impaired individual, and the blue part is the uh, is this collection for a healthy individual. And uh, if you are looking at the simple uh, for each of the single data points, there could be overlap between them. But once you aggregate the distribution, for instance, using the mean as a proxy, you will see that the model will have much uh, more, much lower confidence for a sample that it has never seen, which is a disease sample. And in that case, we will be able to generate uh, a lot of uh, predictions for both unseen patient and healthy controls. And by aggregating those distribution over each patient, we will be able to tell their uh, impairment status. So this is our um, final evaluation at patient level. Uh, now here, uh, each point uh, it represents a subject, and we have its corresponding cover score, which is our prediction score, and this actual uh, MFA score, which is the clinician's judgment. And then we are able to use this healthy train model to provide um, uh, very uh, close estimate of the clinical score, but our method can uh, achieve uh, achieve this estimation at a much faster uh, much faster speed because we don't require the patient to actually go to the clinic and schedule uh, with a trained expert to do all the clinical assessments. And a, I think the key to this is actually how to leverage the clinical information, because uh, in the end, our model is like a, um, a powerful out of distribution detection and quantification tool. But how do you ensure the out of distribution is actually caused by the disease status, but not something else like their gender, their age, or just uh, some different data collection protocols. So this is actually a very interesting problem uh, in uh, when you are uh, deploying a healthcare machine learning models in real world. These are the real considerations you must take into account so that you know that you are generating something meaningful. So in our case is that we specifically constrain this uh, healthy model development to a very specific uh, action segmentation task, which we know and we have discussions with the uh, doctors that this is actually re relevant with the disease progression and development. But uh, we, we also identify like a very tricky point here is with the video uh, data, where we find that uh, in some of the tasks, the patient are, are allocated with an object and they are asked to move the objects on the table, but some objects are dark, but some objects are a light. And this dark object, it actually distorts the model confidence because it is very difficult to tell from the background. So that partially the uh, the job in model uh, confidence actually dates back to this object color. And once discovering that, we did a, a stratification on our patient group based on this object color. We actually find that uh, once we stratify based on this confounding factor, 
we are still able to capture this uh, relationship between the uh, model confidence drop and their uh, clinician score. But this is also like pretty alarming that we have to be really carefully re reviewing every single possible variable in our data, even if it is not fully recorded. So for instance, if you are not looking at the videos yourself, you won't be able to tell, okay, so there's an object and its color is gonna affect the estimation. So um, yeah, that's uh, a quick summary is that uh, there are so many uh, outstanding and exciting opportunities in the world of healthcare data because it's real, it's messy, it wasn't explored before. But when you are actually devoting yourself to this uh, exploration, you have to be really careful knowing what you are dealing with and uh, what are the cautions that you have to take to ensure everything is right on track. Thank you. I guess I, I don't have time to explain the other um, application, but I feel like I um I was like telling the story I would like to share. Thank you. Um, Kengning Akash, is that so? You're, you're all set, right? Because I think there's one student life question that I that's probably great for the three of you. Um, if you have a minute to answer, um. So the one the question, uh, how are you liking the experience of pursuing the PhD at NYU in New York City and were your ex expectations from before joining the program met? So, so, I mean, from my perspective, so I really think New York is a very dynamic city. So there's so much happening here. And the nice thing about here is like uh, right now, I think we've got a lot of, a lot of opportunities to actually work with uh, different uh, professors and co-writers within the university and out of the universities. We also get a lot of opportunities actually intern at different companies and get some industrial experience. So in terms of the opportunity, I think uh, there is a lot, depending on what you want to pursue after your PhD degree, you can maybe do more academic trainings, or if you want to apply for industry job, you can also do more internship in a company. Yeah, and for the, like the perspective on, on living I think it's very, I mean, there is a, so many things happening here and you won't get bored. So that's basically my, what I th I'm thinking about, thinking about. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you so much for your time. So that was just a very small sample of the research that's happening. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say yeah. that that uh, although we had an overrepresentation of medical track people participating, that was more of a sort of an accident of which people were available <laughs> this this week rather than than a reflection of the program as a whole. We we do have all these other tracks from like core machine learning. We do a lot of really interesting work in NLP. We do we do a lot of interesting work in other science applications. Um, so uh, have a look at the at the like web page and the slides that we provided to get a little bit more uh, ideas about what else is going on here uh, and um, reach out to us if you have any additional questions. I think we tried to answer most of the Q and A ones, but um... yeah, I think we only have like nine open, which is good, and Francesca and Joshua are taking care of it. Um, but if you have any questions that you, that we didn't get to answer, please reach out to cds-admissions at nyu.edu, and we'll get back to you as soon as you can, and hopefully we'll see your application after the fifth. There seem to be some rain stands. I don't know what that we can do anything. How does that work? Mm -hmm. Um, I think, so if you have a raised hand, if you could just put in the Q&A, we'll stay on for a few minutes. Uh, staff will stay on for a few minutes to help answer. Um, it'll just be easier than taking verbal questions, but thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Francesca, do you want to stop recording? So the requirements specifically for the data science program are listed on the, on the CDS PhD page. So if you're going to the university-wide 
uh, application page that's not going to be terribly informative specifically for data science, but we have our own web page that should cover everything that you need to know. Uh, let's see what else is there. How many students do we admit? We, we got this question a few times. So it could be as low as eight. It could be as high as 15. Uh, that, that's kind of the general range. Um, Catherine, do you want to take the what the, the next week's open house is going to be about? Because I don't know that. Yeah, I'm not sure which open house they are speaking. Or is it the grad fair? fair. No. Fair. Grad fair. Oh, yeah, Francesca, do you want to speak about the grad fair? Yeah, so the grad fair is the it's an NYU wide grad fair. We will be attending there if you plan to attend, but it will likely just be covering the same information as this session. So um, you're welcome to join if you wanna chat with us in person, but otherwise there won't necessarily be any new information shared that's not hasn't already been shared today. So about which professors, sounds good. Um, maybe an important one about which uh, professors accept students. So we, we, we try to pull our faculty every year and most of them do. Uh, if, you're, if your uh, application is sort of um, targeted for a very specific potential advisor, you might want to reach out to them to check whether they are taking students. But, but most of the faculty that we're listing on the webpage are planning to take students this cycle. Um, social sciences, yes, we have that too, <laughs> although we, we couldn't find somebody to give a talk about it today. Um, so there are, um, there's sort of like, there's an entire section on sort of like text as data that, that um, has applications in sort of like policy and politics and things like that. So trying to understand how Twitter affects voting patterns or... <laughs> Um, th th these are outside of my my core um, expertise, so so I, I I'm vague by um, by virtue of not knowing that much about it. But we we definitely have uh, research um, projects in that realm happening at CDS um, at the moment. Um, Student housing is a concern, but I, I guess I'm going to let either Francesca or Catherine take that one. Um, in the in previous years, we've provided a small subsidy for housing. I don't know if that will be the case for the upcoming cycle, but it is it has been an option. Um, housing is very expensive at NYU, but we do try to connect students with incoming students to kind of help give tips and either find roommates and such. But um. There, there may be a small subsidy. It's just not, it hasn't been determined for the future cycles. And yes, many students, because it's a nine, nine months step, but many students go do internships during the summer. So that, that's a very common occurrence. Uh, yes, and you do, you are expected to mention in the application what kind of topics and what kind of advisors would be appropriate for you. Like we, we, we like th this is a a little bit of a matching exercise. So it's not only about finding excellent students, but finding excellent students that can like successfully work with the existing faculty at CDS. So, um, like finding good good matches is important. Okay, I think we're. We have uh, exhausted that our list. Oh, of <laughs> oh no, one more. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so uh, psychology and psychiatry. So so uh, Brendan Lake is is co um, like has a half appointment in, in in psychology. So if you're interested in basic research in psychology um, and cognitive science, he would be the right person to contact. Um, specifically about psychiatry, I don't know. That would be part of the medical track faculty. But I, I think there are options in that realm as well. Great. Good. Yeah, we seem to have answered all of the questions. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> 328 questions. I think we did well. <laughs> thank um, you. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for your time. So as we mentioned, we'll be sending the recording out. It may take a week or so to get, get it out. But once once it's posted, we'll email everyone. 
um, that attended or on the um, prospective student list as well. 